Good morning and Merry Christmas. I would take uh, just a moment to point out that we will have a Christmas Eve service. We won't be meeting in person, uh, but it will be online for you, uh, a service of lessons and carols, and uh, I encourage you to, uh, to put that on on the 24th, and we'll let you know at what time that becomes available. Read with me from the Song of Mary recorded for us in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold... When the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he, has do, is, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Let's pray. Our mighty God and our loving Heavenly Father, we would come before you this day and ask that by the power of your Spirit we would be free to cry aloud as, as Elizabeth cried aloud, how can it be that my God should come to me? Grant to us the freedom to, to stand before your word and to be judged by it because we know that you are a loving and gracious God and that you draw us to yourself. Uh, grant us that freedom this morning. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Last week, <clears throat> we heard the story of the angel Gabriel coming to young Mary. Mary was told that she would conceive and bear a son whom she was to call Jesus. This was to happen without the agency of a human father. The Spirit of God would overshadow her that, so that her child would be called Holy, the Son of God. That was, to, that was a lot to take in for a teenage girl, uh, especially one looking forward to the beginning of her adult life with marriage immediately around the corner. Mary would, would imagine all of the ramifications of this extraordinary event. If that takes place, then marriage to Joseph is probably out when he finds her, me pregnant. A child out of wedlock would, 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 would virtually guarantee extreme poverty and a lifetime of shame. Everything good that a, a humble country girl might hope for was almost certainly stripped from her by this declaration from God. <laughs> a declaration, by the way, which begins with, you have found favor with God. Mary is an object of his grace. Now Mary did get to be married to Joseph. An angel did come to Joseph in a dream, we're told in Matthew, and told him not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. Mary is not a key biblical figure, but she is remarkable. All that we know of her is that she is poor. She sees herself as, as those described as the hungry, the humble, the invisible people. Mary cannot understand all that is happening and what it all means. None of us could. But she treasures up these things in her heart. We know one crystal clear thing about Mary. She was as quick to submit to the Lord as any figure in the Bible. We are told of the conversation between her and the angel Gabriel last week. Mary knew she was given a message from God. It was rather unmistakable. And she has only one response. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. 
Let it be, me, be to me according to your word. How many of the giants of history, in the history of God's revelation to man, Moses, judges, prophets, struggled with their calling and, and tried to turn it down often again and again. Mary has immediately, immediate utter simplicity. The Lord has spoken, let it be, I am a servant. This humility of Mary's is not simply the basis upon which a person comes to accept the grace of God. It's, it's the basis upon which a person is free to believe that God is good, to actually enjoy him. Jesus said that only those who receive the kingdom of God like a little child will, will enter. How does a child receive something? With complete trust, without hesitation. That's how Mary receives the word of the Lord. Now, if you are tempted to imagine that Mary is selected for her piety, that she, is, she has made herself into a godly woman, and so God chooses her in reward, think again. Mary is a simple and honest person. What does she say? Mary says that God has looked upon her humble estate. Mary is nobody, but she has found favor with God. God has bestowed grace upon her. It is this grace that makes her sing. What does she sing about? Does she sing about her arrival after years of striving to be recognized and to, to achieve a standing before God? No. She sings about the astonishing favor of God that surprises and turns the world upside down. Mary has heard the gospel, has heard from the angel uh, that her older and formerly barren relative Elizabeth is six months pregnant. And so she travels a significant distance to see her. Who do you go talk to when an angel from God tells you that you will supernaturally, while you are still a virgin, conceive and give birth to the Son of the Most High? Who will reign on David's throne forever? <laughs> you go to the only person in the world who can understand and feel what you feel, perhaps your relative, shall we call her Aunt Elizabeth, who's supernaturally pregnant by the power of God. It is no small walk. 90 to 130 kilometers, depending on where in the hill country Zachariah and Elizabeth live. And we're told that Mary went with haste. Now Mary arrives. She comes into Uncle Zachariah's home and Aunt Elizabeth's house, greets Elizabeth, and another supernatural event takes place. The baby in Elizabeth's womb uh, leaps. And Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and speaks of things no one but God knows. With a loud cry, Elizabeth says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how can it be given to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth is the elder relative, and she is of the priestly class. She has status a little bit for, uh, above Mary for both of those things, her age, her priestly class. But she exclaims that it is a privilege beyond wonder that Mary should come to her. Elizabeth supernaturally confirms all the angel Gabriel has said to Mary. And she goes beyond that. She says, blessed is she who believed that what the Lord spoke to her, that it would come to pass. Mary's response to God's grace and promise to her was faith. It was quite a walk that Mary just took to get to Elizabeth in a hurry. Did Mary worry over all the time that she might be losing her life with God's sudden intervention during this 100-kilometer power walk? No. She believed it would come to pass. She wanted what God said to come to pass. What is the essence of faith revealed here? That Mary believes that God is good. That his plan, no matter how difficult, no matter how potentially painful it may look, is good. God is, is good, as the refrain in worship goes, all the time, God is good. When Jesus was presented as a child at the temple, an elderly man named Simeon takes the baby, uh, Jesus, up in his arms, and he, he declares, I can now die in peace, for I have seen the Lord's salvation. Mary and Joseph marvel. And Simeon also says to Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul as well. It's intriguing that Mary, whom all generations will call blessed of the Lord, is also remembered by another name, Our Lady of Sorrows. 
Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe, Jesus will later say. There, there is much that will come to pass in the lives of God's children. And there are two ways to view what comes to pass in our lives. Either we see the events of life like Mary is the will of God and believe that he is good. Or we fear that what we wish will not come to pass and that any disturbance to our hopes and plans means that God is not good. And that is a trap of idolatry. We are all familiar with it. It's idolatry to worship God for what he will give us rather than to worship him and proclaim in every circumstance that God is good all the time. God is good. It's easy to forget that the Christmas story takes place after 400 years of prophetic silence. 400 years. The Israelites read the scriptures about the things that would come, the Messiah that would come. On the day of the Lord, the prophet Joel said, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, as we see Elizabeth and Mary doing. The final chapter of the last prophet, Malachi, says that those who fear the name of the Lord, for them, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. That's what's said of Elizabeth's womb. John the Baptist leaped when Mary walks in. Mary and Elizabeth stand at the beginning of the greatest moment in human history, and only they know, <laughs> though only in part, what is going on. 400 years Israel has waited for the fulfillment of the Lord's promises to hear his voice again. And here we have two simple, uh, most likely illiterate Hebrew women, but they have clearly heard the scriptures. They have spoken of them. They have dwelt upon them. And they are the first to understand that the Lord is coming to his people as he has promised for so long. There has only ever been one thing that can bear the enormous weight of our trust and not fall. That's the word of God. Now we come to the song of Mary. Not that she necessarily sang it. It is, it is in poetic form like, like the Psalms with allusions to the, the sweep of Scripture. When a song comes into a narrative like this, it is always a window to meaning. It is the interpretation of the events that have taken place. And there are a sweep of songs throughout the Scripture, the song of Moses, the song of Miriam, the song of Deborah. And we can go on. Mary, the song, fits in that great sweep of the songs of God's people. She begins with magnifying the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Now, I would dispense with one idea very quickly. How do we know that Mary is not a sinless being to be prayed to as a, a co-redeemer with Jesus? As, as some have, have taught only fairly relatively recently in some corners of Christianity. We know that because the Bible never even hints at such a concept. We know that because of what we see in our text here, that Mary knows herself to be a sinner in need of mercy. She exults in God's mercy and she calls him her savior. Now it's not embarrassing to notice that Mary begins praising God with regard to how he's treated her. She talks about herself to begin with. She moves on as if forgetting entirely about herself. That is the course of our personal experience. It's the course of our emotional lives. And it's not wrong that Mary celebrates that God has looked upon her and that all generations will call her blessed, for that is the case. For indeed, the Lord has done great things for her. <laughs> Say it. She begins with magnifying the Lord and rejoicing in her Savior. There are parallel statements. So when Mary says her soul magnifies and her spirit rejoices, she's, she's using Hebrew parallelism. Parallelism. She's not saying she has a soul and a spirit. The terms are interchangeable. Mary's last personal statement in verse 49, the Lord has done great things for her, is followed by, and holy is his name. It would not do to refer to the Lord and herself in the same sentence without pointing out that God is not like you and me. He is holy other. He is holy. And with this turn of her attention to the Lord, Mary begins the sweep of history. 
God's mercies upon those who fear him from generation to generation. The God who made us has spoken to our fathers. He's promised his mercy and a redemption from evil. The Lord's mercy is upon those who fear him. What does it mean to fear God? It means to consider him first. What is it that's upon your mind first and last? Honor him first. In every decision and significant thought, those who fear the Lord consider, what has the Lord said? What would he have me do and think and feel about, about this? Those who fear the Lord walk before the face of God, the Old Testament says. Those who ignore the Lord, who knowingly violate his commands and, ex- and his express will without remorse, without repentance, you know, well, clearly they do not fear the Lord. Does the Lord know? Does the Lord see? They say. Verse 51 starts with a, a military image. The Lord has shown strength with his arm. What has our divine warrior done? He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And that phrase is reminiscent of the Tower of Babel, where human society rebelled against God in their pride, and the Lord separated human language and scattered them. The mighty have been brought down from their thrones. In contrast, the Lord exalts the humble. He fills he. He fills the hungry with good things and he sends the rich away empty. The kingdom of God is is a great reversal. The values of his kingdom are not the values of this world. What does our world value? Well, today it's pretty similar to as it was in ancient Rome. We value power, honor, wealth, control. What did Jesus teach were the values of the kingdom of God? He said, Blessed, blessed are, hilariously happy are those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the poor, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for his namesake. That describes the life that Jesus lived for us to go to the cross and to suffer on our behalf. It's the life he enables his followers to live. It's not a life that Jesus enables us to endure actually a life of joy, like we see in Mary and Elizabeth in our passage today. Look at verse 53. The Lord has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Part of the reversal that the shattering entrance of the kingdom of God brings, yes, but it's not simply about food and the necessities of life. It's true, the historical difference between the rich and the poor is is that the rich don't go go, go to sleep hungry. Not unless they choose to. But the poor do experience hunger at times. But nowhere does it say in the Bible that it's better to be poor than rich. (laughs) There's no inherent nobility in poverty. But there is a tremendous advantage spiritually in knowing at a deep level that you do not possess the answers to your own problems. The Psalms and the prophets use the language of hunger and feasting to demonstrate spiritual realities. Some of my favorite verses are from Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread and your labor on that which does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me and hear that your soul may live. What did Jesus say in the wilderness when he was tempted? Quoting from Deuteronomy, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How did John, how did John uh, begin his gospel? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What did Jesus say about himself in John 6? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. When Mary sings that the Lord has filled the hungry with good things, she's talking about more than bread. She's talking about God's mercy. No matter how much food or how many good things you may have, if you do not have God's mercy, 
then you will forever be without the only thing that is good, God himself. To whom does God's mercy come? Well, to those who are so captive to God's grace, they look to him. They honor and magnify him by contrast to the proud who are scattered in the thoughts of their minds, of their hearts. Do you remember the first time you were conscious of truly free and great thoughts that were beyond yourself? I remember when the Lord touched my life in university and I was suddenly thinking about him and not myself. And I was filled with a praise for him that I'd never had before when I read his word. The smaller I became and the larger God became, the greater was my joy and the stronger my, my desire to serve him. Those were my, my first glimpses of real freedom. I wanted to obey God and place my life in Jesus' hands simply because of his astonishing grace to me. Before, I wanted to obey sometimes and in some ways, but only because I thought I could benefit by it. But in those moments in university, when I first reveled in the opportunity to obey God, I didn't matter what it would cost me because I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is good. That is what Mary means when she says that God has filled the hungry with good things. The Lord gives to us his very self. So Mary moves from her situation in the first verses to the great sweep of God's actions throughout time, right into the work of God in the very hearts of people, exalting the humble, scattering the proud, to the final verses, 54 and 55 where she sees this thing that has come to happen to her is actually the fulfillment of all God's promises to Israel. This pregnancy of Mary's, this child who will be called holy, the son of the Most High, is the fulfillment of God's revelation to mankind, even back to Abraham himself, through whom the Lord promised to bless every nation on earth. Now, why do we understand that this Jesus that is to be born will be for every nation? Paul says in Galatians 3 that the Lord preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So Paul goes on. Those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And a few verses later, Paul concludes, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. All the promises to God's people throughout the history of God's revelation are fulfilled in Christ and given to God's people by faith. Mary's song is, is one in a line of songs that point in the Bible to God's great work that he is accomplishing to redeem a people to himself from every tribe upon the earth through this coming child. And who is this child? We are told he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaims that this child is her Lord. <laughs> the job description of this mighty deliverer to show mercy to those who fear him, to scatter the proud, to bring down the mighty, to exalt the humble, it's the job description of Almighty God. If you have any doubt as to who Jesus is, you need, no, need to no, look no further than verse 49 where we're told his name is holy. The deity of, of Jesus Christ is not something the early church made up to explain the empty tomb. It was revealed in, in greater clarity through, throughout the revelation of the entire Old Testament as the Old Testament went on. We began our service with reading from Micah, but you, Bethlehem, Epaphrathah, Though you are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth one who is to be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. The prophet Isaiah said in chapter 9, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In Zechariah 12, the Lord says, they will look on me whom they pierced. Hebrews 1 quotes the Old Testament seven times to establish the deity of the Messiah and to go on to show that he is greater than the angels, than Moses, than Melchizedek. Because he offers a perfect sacrifice, 
He is both the high priest and the sacrifice at once, a sacrifice that is once for all time. Colossians 1 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the creator of all things, before all things, and in whom all things hold together. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. It is hard to accept that the Holy Other, God Almighty, would humble himself to become a man. It's foolishness to the Roman world. It's utterly impossible to the Jewish mind. But this earth-shattering event is not actually hidden when we look back at the Old Testament. Tim Keller writes, If Jesus didn't come, the story of Christmas is one more moral paradigm to crush you. If Jesus didn't come, I wouldn't want to be anywhere around these Christmas stories that say we need to be sacrificing. We need to be humble. We need to be loving. All that will do is crush you into the ground. But if Jesus is actually God come in the flesh, you're going to know much more about God. If Jesus is who he says he is, we have a 500-page autobiography from God, in a sense. And our understanding will be vastly more personal and specific than any philosophy or religion could give us because of Christmas. Look at what God has done to get you to know him personally. If the Son would come all this way to become a real person to you, don't you think the Holy Spirit will do anything in his power to make Jesus a real person to you in your heart? Christmas is an invitation by God. Look what I've done to come near to you. Now draw near to me. I don't want to be a concept. I want to be a friend. What are we to take from this passage that shows Elizabeth and Mary celebrating with great joy that God has come to them? And Mary's song about God's mercy. I think the child perhaps even more quickly than the Hebrew scholar can see the simple contrast. Two virtually invisible women of no social standing are the first to see hear and understand the greatest moment in human history. God will reverse the values and reality of this world with truth and love. The proud will be scattered and those who fear the Lord will become the objects of his mercy. There are simple questions to ask. If this is what God does for his people, are you seeing him do that for you? Your life should have joy and wonder at God's grace to you. How can it be that the God of heaven and earth has made himself known to me in his love and his mercy? How easy it is for you to say, how easy is it? May it be to to me, as you've said, for I am your servant. Can you say that to whatever the Lord may bring and whatever he may ask of your life? Proud people like to be served rather than to be servants. You know, when I most clearly find this pride in my heart lately, when I'm sitting on a cold ocean hoping that a halibut fish will bite. Halibut are not easy to find. And I know that if I catch a halibut, it's because God gives me one. Plain and simple. Every good gift comes from your Heavenly Father above. But I can feel the thoughts that come out of the depths of my heart. Here I am, Lord, I haven't caught a halibut in months, and you should be giving me a halibut. Sometimes I'm able to smile and repent when those thoughts arise, but other times I sit and I stew. Because I really am struggling with whether I am God's servant when my my heart wants him to be my servant. Now that's a silly observation where we find bitterness in our own heart. But it's a gift whenever it comes, when the Lord points it out to us and says, look where your heart is. We tend to think that God is around to serve us rather than to present his glory and his grace to sinners. So the proud want to be served rather than to be God's servant. Which are you? Now I could tell you that the point of this passage is to be humble. And we would miss the point altogether and you would feel 20 pounds more weight upon your shoulders. Humility. That's something I'm going to work on starting in January when I take, start my little diet. 
if I can find the time. The reason we don't want to submit to God is because we are proud. The greatest sin of pride is to reject what is clearly said about Jesus, that he is the Savior of sinners and that you are a sinner who needs him. Make this Christmas like Mary and Elizabeth's Christmas. Come to Jesus, who calls you to himself, who promises to give you a place of service beside him. For those of you who have placed your faith in Jesus, sing with Mary that the one who is mighty has done great things for you. And let your soul rejoice in God your Savior. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you because you have revealed yourself to be a God of mercy and grace, that you are good. So we would repent of the pride of our life. We would repent that we often look to you to serve us. Father, we would be people who exult in your glory, your greatness, and your goodness and worship you this Christmas. For you have given to us your Son who has lived a life of purpose, perfect obedience that his sacrifice might pay the penalty for our sins, that we might be clothed in his righteousness, that we may be able to lift our face toward you, knowing that no shame comes between us. For you have loved us to the uttermost, and we are free to live with honesty before you. Grant us this joy, that we may worship your Son and magnify him. It's his name we ask it. Amen.